we'd like to welcome everybody to our September session um, into the elk woods. Um, what's super exciting is I heard from a few of our participants already that have returned from elk hunts um, and are fixing to go out on an elk hunt. So the timing is just impeccable. Uh, I wish we could have had it before some of you guys went afield already, but <laughs> um, you can definitely participate and interject some of the do's and don'ts of elk hunting <laughs> during our session to help everybody else. Because imminently, uh, Stephanie will be joining uh, the Elk Woods in just a matter of days. So super excited for her. But welcome, everybody. Um, if you could, uh, you know the drill, introduce yourself uh, from where you're from in the chat if you have the ability to do so. Um, we like also a really casual atmosphere. Uh, so if you guys have the ability and would like to share your beautiful shining faces with us, um, you're welcome to turn your cameras on. But if not, uh, we know that there are reasons why you don't have your cameras on. So we're good with either one. Uh, for those who are joining us new, we have a lot of new uh, names in our participant list. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Morgan. I'm the honorary coordinator for the Department of Game and Fish. I'm based out of Albuquerque. Uh, I'll let the rest of the staff introduce themselves. So uh, Stephanie, I'll just kick it over to you. Hey everyone, I am Stephanie and I am the Assistant Hunter Education Coordinator based out of Albuquerque. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I am going on my elk hunt this week and super pumped. And this could not come at a better time because I'm really excited to talk about it. Hey everybody, my name is Colleen Payne. I'm the Public Information Specialist for the Department of Game and Fish, actually based out of the Las Cruces office. So I cover the Southwest area. Um, and a lot of really cool elk country and uh, excited to share with you some elk tonight and um, hopefully help you on your next hunt. I'm, and I'm super excited for Stephanie's hunt. So we're going to use this as a scouting kind of prep <laughs> deal for her and for everybody else too. All right. I just want to interject real quick. And I want to say, Christiana, I love that you're cooking dinner right now and listening to this. I envy <laughs> your multi-focus because man, can't do it. So good for you. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Share with us your recipes when you're done. <laughs> and good evening, everyone. I'm Tristiana Bigford. I'm the Assistant Chief of Education, also based out of Albuquerque. And I wasn't lucky enough to draw an elk tag this year, but maybe next year. So thank you all for joining us. And I noticed that Tristana did put in the chat um, a link to all of our previous social hour sessions. So for those of you who are new and or you maybe forgot where to find those um, that recorded library of our sessions, uh, the link is in the chat for you. So we have got a lot of really fun, cool information to uh, share with you all this evening. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my screen share up. Make sure it wants to lay. Thumbs up if everybody can hear my, or hear. Can you hear my screen share? Can you see my screen share? <laughs> Later on, you will be able to hear it, hopefully. It's so great. I feel like I'm there already. So yes, oh, I can hear it. Fantastic. Yeah, that's why I, I chose this background too, because I'm really ready for fall. So <laughs> I'm like past ready for fall. <clears throat> awesome. So into the elk woods we go. And again, we uh, keep these sessions fairly casual. So if at any time uh, anybody has any questions, please feel free to fire away uh, any questions in the chat. Um, if somebody is not actually actively speaking, then the rest of us will be uh, mediating that conversation and when appropriate, we will interject your questions into the conversation or you can use the raise hand button because we love to actually hear from you or see your, your faces. So um, please know that this is session is, is very, inter we want it interactive, so. Um, so first of all, before we even start going out into the woods, no matter if you're scouting for elk or whatever the species is that you might have drawn a tag, or you're getting ready now to go out on your hunt, you need to do a gear check. <clears throat> Some of this might be a little bit um, has where we covered some of this before in some previous lady social hours. Um, but these are some of the absolute essentials that anybody needs to have before you go field, especially if you're going by yourself or it's just you and, and another person. 
Um, but make sure you have uh, really good, sturdy, waterproof boots. Don't go and buy a pair uh, the day before and then think these are the best fitting boots ever. Wear them out on your hunt and you're going to regret that for sure. So don't do that. Plan way in advance. Uh, for the bright boots. And then that way, if they don't work for you, a lot of these retailers will actually have a return policy. So it'll allow you to also do that as well. But definitely buy the best boots that you can that's gonna give you that ankle support and, and whatever your foot might need. Um, <clears throat> there's several out there on the market. So just go try them on and, and find the one that fits you the best. Um, packs are another huge one, um, depending upon what you're doing for your particular trip. If it's a scouting trip, then maybe just a day pack is going to work really good for you. Um, but if you're actually going out for a hunt, ensure that that pack, no matter what it is, has the proper fit and ventilation. I think we've all worn packs, packs before, especially as women, and they were designed for a man and they ride on your hips and they're super uncomfortable or they don't fit your shoulders. And then now you feel after wearing that for a couple of days that you're just all kind of a mess <laughs> in your back and your hips. So try those kind of things on well in advance. Uh, make sure that it does fit properly around your waist and that there's different areas that will allow you to adjust for your body type and potentially where that weight load is gonna be. Um, I should have brought one of my packs in here, but you can kind of see on this particular one, they have what they call load lifters. So when you do get a really heavy load, you can actually, um, it takes the weight off of certain areas of your body. So it it's not just riding right down on top of you. Um, they're amazing, especially if you've got a load you're coming out with. Um, so just look for those dual purpose packs, um, ones that you have lots of storage. Uh, some of them you can actually separate out like this to where you can put some quarters down between the actual hard part of the pack and the rest of it. And so then that way you're not sticking your game meat inside with all of your clothes and, and everything else. But look at, look at all the different types of functionalities of packs. Um, hey Jen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in right there if you don't mind sure. yeah um, go ahead. We, had a, we had a couple of comments questions in the chat since we're on the topic of packs um I, I, I get it girls i've been there of not finding a pack that fits or trying to find one that fits right or is the right weight and has the right kind of setup and a lot more outdoor companies are definitely changing their um and adding products especially that are tailored and designed for women. So there are female built packs out there now. Badlands makes some, Mystery Ranch. Um, QU just came out with a women's suspension frame, um, which I've actually just tested out and loved. Um, it, it fits really well. Um, so there are definitely some options out there for you and a really good fitting pack, I feel is like 99% as important as a really good pair of boots because you're going to be wearing that all day and you want something that's going to be comfortable and, and meets your needs. So a lot of the stores like Cabela's and Bass Pros and Sportsman's have packs there. Go and try some on. Um, definitely go and try some on and see how they fit um, and if you can find the kind of the right size and stuff that you need. But there are definitely some good pack options out there. I just kind of wanted to hit on that because we had a couple yeah, no, I, thank you for doing that because it is literally essential and it can make or break you on a hunt for sure. Um, uh, I have a Kuyu pack too that I absolutely love. I, it's the Icon Pro and it fits me really well. I'm, I'm not very long in the torso, but it fits me very, very well. And then I know Proist makes an all ladies pack. They make ladies um, camo and outdoor gear and they have come up with a really nice pack as well that fits various types of um, body sizes and types. So, um, and a lot yeah. of these companies are really great about returns. So if you get it and you put some weight in there and you're like, this is just not working out then you pack it all back up and send it back. Stephanie, did you have something to add on that? Yeah, that you stole it from me, right from underneath me. I was just going to talk about order some and return it because like the QUs and stuff you can't get in stores, right? So mm -mm. some of it, you have to do it in 
an, a significant amount of time before your hunt. So, you know, start ordering now. If you've already done your hunt, start ordering now and trying those things out for, you know, next year and, and returning them if need be and whatnot. So, um, uh, yeah, you stole it from me. So, <laughs> way to steal my thing. Great minds think alike. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next one that is so very important um, that I kind of learned a little bit later on in, in my uh, hunting and outdoor enjoyment is uh, the extra socks. Oh my gosh, extra socks will make or break your blisters. Um, and there's actually actually socks out there that I've found that are double layered to where if your feet slip and stuff, it creates, um, it keeps your feet from getting hot spots. So, which if you're doing a lot of walking and up and down terrain um, at, is a lifesaver. Um, but that's part of the clothing part here with layering is key. Find lightweight, breathable um, clothing, depending upon if you're early season elk hunting, uh, it's been hot. Um, so layering is key. The last thing you want to do is get super sweaty. And then when things start cooling down, then you get your clothes are wet. And if you don't have the proper clothing, that's going to wick that and dry quickly. Um, you can run the risk later on that evening if you're coming out of getting chilled. And so you don't want to have that happen to you. So take enough clothes that's lightweight and breathable and you can layer that and put it on and off as needed. Um, especially if you have to hike up to a glassing spot, now you get hot. Um, and then you're sitting there for a little while, you're getting cold to put, you know, so it's all that kind of on and off, on and off, but it's well worth it. And it keeps you comfortable while you're in the field. Um, but yeah, extra socks is key. It sounds kind of funny, but it literally has made it so much more enjoyable for me to be in the field for sure, especially if you're putting on miles. And then uh, Tristana had a really cool um, tidbit about camel fire. I jumped on there just real quick and man, they have got a lot of really great gear at really good prices um, for boots and, and you name it. And they're inventory circulates daily. So, you know, get on there and if they don't have something one day, then they might have it the next day, but check it out. It is a really good website for sure. Um, every pack, regardless if it's a day pack or you're going to be out there for more than just the day is you need to have a decent first aid kit. Um, tweezers, basic band-aids, mole skin. If you do end up getting a blister, um, that, if, one of the things I want to point out right now is if you start thinking you're getting a hot spot on your heel or your foot, sit down and take care of it right away because that is a blister about to happen. So change your socks or put on a Band-Aid or some wool skin because um, that is going to save you from getting a, a blister eventually. But have some of that in your first aid kit. But just your basic stuff um, to have is is definitely key and and make sure you have if you have medications and things like that that expire just double check that stuff before um you actually go afield um and for those of you who have any kind of allergies and, and whatnot make sure that all of those epi pins and stuff are also up to date um as well i like to actually tape my heels as a preventative anymore because i feel like eventually if you walk enough miles and you're going to be out there for enough days um, you're going to get a blister on your heels, no matter, no matter what, it's just going to rub. And, um, I use Luco tape and it works pretty nicely. I put like a couple layers and it sticks really well. So just something to keep in mind too, if you're really out there for a long time. Cool. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, the next item here is optics. Um, again, try to purchase the best ones that you can afford. Don't go in debt by any means, but get the best ones that you can afford. And a lot of companies out there now are starting to make some good high quality products with really good quality glass that aren't going to, you know, cost your firstborn. So, um, but look at that. Um, if you do a lot of glassing um, or you see an animal that's quite a ways away and you want to know if it's worth going after or not, Good optics are going to really help you there with a clear view and on all that. Um, the word escaped me, so somebody help me. When you get the mirage or the the wave, the heat waves, you get really good glass. It will help minimize that in the hotter part of the days. Um, but and eye fatigue. Um, if you do spend a lot of time glassing, 
Uh, you can get, your eyes will get super tired. And for those of, the, of you like myself who are prone to migraines, um, that eye fatigue <laughs> will trigger one of those. So good, good glass um, really helps with that. Um, make sure you have your calls, have a myriad of different things because depending on your situation, then will you have your little grab bag of, okay, that's not working, let's try this, or let, this is a new sound, maybe they'll respond to that. Um, but have all your, your calls uh, ready to go in one of those little outside pouches so it's easy to grab. Um, your field dressing kit, make sure that if you've used it the season before that it's super sharp. <laughs> Don't, that's one of the first things you probably should take out um, if you've ever used them is take that thing out and leave it out until you get those knives sharpened and taken care of. That way you don't take it into the field with you next season and a spoon would have worked just as well as your knife sharpening kit. So make sure you have sharp knives. Um, this is a no brainer, but I, I kid you not, people have forgotten the most primary thing that you need to take with you on your hunt is that is your firearm, your muzzle loader, or your bow. So that's why I put it on there. Or you take your muzzle loader and you forgot the, you know, the sabots, or you forgot your patches, or you forgot a component of XYZ. So just make sure that if you have a particular method that you're going to be hunting with, um, let's say archery season is, is right now. So you have your bow, you have your release, you have your arm guard if you need it. You have, you know, a, a sight in target that way. If something gets knocked off, then you have something that you can recite it back in at camp. So do your own personal checklist on stuff. Um, that way you don't forget anything. Uh, water filter. I know that uh, this has been hit on a few times in other previous social hours is that, um, especially if you're gonna do a lot of walking, there's only so much water you personally can take. So make sure you have mechanism of if there's water in the area, then you can safely filter that water to refill your water bottle and you can keep going. Um, don't get dehydrated out in the field. It is no kind of fun. Uh, snacks, um, all of us, especially tea. <laughs> and Stephanie, I'm finding out is definitely snack oriented. So make sure you have your snacks because there's no kind of, it's not any kind of fun being in the field with somebody who's angry. So have snacks. Uh, license and tag, don't forget that, uh, GPS, and of course a lot of us have these types of really cool devices on our phones, so that helps you, but a lot of people like just using a standalone GPS, and of course if you have these things, make sure the batteries, you have extra batteries, um, or uh, they're all in working order, and a camera. Uh, if, if those of you guys who are out in the field and you're really worried about weight, maybe a camera might not be so good, but everybody's got these really super cool phones now that this camera, this phone takes better pictures now than I think even a really nice digital camera is pretty comparable. So uh, don't forget to take pictures uh, and, and like journal your adventures. You know, it's, you go back and look on at, at those pictures and you're like, man, that was a really cool time. Anything in the chat or anything, ladies, that you would like to add to this particular gear list? Since we just, I guess, talked about camera and it's something that we kind of get psycho about, I guess, on our hunts, is, is taking those photos. And it's not just of, you know, if you get a harvest or not. It is if, you, you know, document your entire trip because these are memories and stuff that you can go back on and what's cool about these phones and cameras and stuff now being digital is you could take thousands of photos and if you took you know 500 really bad ones you can delete them it's not like film yeah. that you have to get processed you know it's always stuff that you can go back and delete and even if you take you know hundreds of photos and go back and look at them you're still going to think man I wish I would have taken more photos of this or that or whatever um, but that being said too the photos that you do take and, and I know we kind of hit on this a lot, but it, seeing we have such a new group of folks in here, I thought it was important to kind of hit on it too, is the photos that you do take, make sure that they're clean, make sure that they're ethical and respectful, because it, no matter who you share them to, if you do share them with anybody, um, it represents the hunting community and you as a hunter. So, you know, if you do get an elk down, you know, clean up whatever blood you can, stuff the tongue back in the mouth that's like probably my number one pet peeve is I see these amazing um animals that that people have hunted and amazing photos that they've taken but all I could see is the bloody tongue that's hanging out of the mouth so just stuff it back in cut it out not a big deal um 
but get lots of good photos. And it, it's your one time opportunity to do that because once you start field dressing or you get him back to the truck or get them loaded, you don't have those opportunities again. So I just kind of wanted to hit on the camera thing because I absolutely, it's one of my favorite parts about the hunt is taking photos throughout the entire thing. I'm like the paparazzi when it yeah. comes to that on Absolutely. <laughs> it, it's almost like journaling your adventure. And yeah. I can't stress enough too that there's been times where I haven't taken a picture and I wish I would have just literally taken the five seconds to take a picture. Um, whether it's a, a beautiful view that you can never duplicate again or a flower or yeah, sometimes I don't even get anywhere anymore because that's all I'm doing is taking pictures. I'm like, I really need to get moving. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So. And sometimes I feel totally corny doing it too. And I just need to put that aside and, and keep doing it anyways. But one thing I was going to mention, the last thing about the pictures is, is also take pictures of what you're learning, you know, tracks that you see, bushes, plants that you see. Like I was on a grouse hunt recently and the only thing I could connect to everything where I was finding birds was this one bush. And I took a picture of it and I took it back to Jennifer. And I'm like, what the heck is this thing? <laughs> like, I just, I need to learn more about it because apparently the birds like it. Um, uh, on so that note, Stephanie, let me tell you about something cool that I learned about the photos that you do take. And I just learned this a couple months ago when we were in Alaska. But if you take, if you have an iPhone and it's updated and you take a photo of a plant, and then you, you know, click on the photo and click info, it'll give you a link to what that plant is. So you could use it as Get a out. plant ID, I swear. It was the coolest little thing ever. So you can learn about that plant. And I noticed it does do it for animals too. So if you take a picture of animal, hit info, it'll tell, it's not always correct, but <laughs> it's pretty dang close. And it, it may not even know, like, cause there was a lot of plants that they didn't, I don't know. Apple didn't know what it was, but that's just a cool thing. You know, talking about learning. I know we've got a ton to cover tonight, so I don't want to take all so the time on photos. Real quick, some of our comments. You know, Onyx has been really amazing for some people. Um, some people Ooh, like we're going to get to that. To toilet paper and hand warmers um, are important. Um, an extra shirt just in case you get a little too sweaty. Um, maybe that's for like the day trip type of stuff. Um, so yes, we use rangefinders. Yeah. Rangefinders fall into the optics fall into the category. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good points. Most definitely. But yeah, thank you for blowing my mind about that Apple deal because I'm going to be all over that. I'm going to go out in the backyard after we get done and I'm going to just see how accurate this thing is. If it says that my one tree and my tomato plant is the pine tree, then I'm maybe the credibility isn't going to be so good but i'm going to try that thank you colleen that's super cool Ooh. it is super cool all right so we'll go ahead and move on the next thing that um i kind of added in as well that ladies you might not have I, I this is like one of these afterthoughts but make sure that you have a hunting trip plan and you leave this with somebody that you can trust um i cannot stress this enough um i actually had a friend just this last weekend who um got broke her truck broke down in the Gila and she didn't let anybody know. And so when she finally got uh, through uh, to a tow truck, she had to wait six hours. And it's like, man, if you would have told me, I <laughs> think called me, we could have probably been there a whole lot faster than six hours. Um, but it's super important to give this to somebody. Um, that way, if something does go wrong or you need assistance, somebody can find you. Um, a couple of things, too, that are out there on the market. There's so many different new types of satellite communication resources, devices that are available. Um, if you know you're going to be in an area that you either don't have good cell service or no service, uh, sometimes always count on no service. And so these particular devices, um, these are those Garmin inReaches. They come in different sizes. You can, oh, and Colleen's got hers right there. What's nice is, yes, the initial investment of the devices can be a little pricey, but you know what? Your life is worth it. And the, the ones that love you, um, it's worth it to them. And so get one. Um, don't make that an excuse. Uh, don't buy Starbucks for a couple of weeks and you'll be good. Um, but get one of these. And then what's nice is that you can turn the service on and off. 
and then you can select the type of service that you want. That way, at least you can communicate with those who love you and care about you um, on the outside world that you're okay and or, hey, I had to move spots because there was too much pressure here. So this is where I'm at now. So anytime your hunting trip plan changes, you need to be letting those people know who have it. So look into these devices. This is just a few that I just found out there. Um, you can buy them on Amazon. You don't have to go to a specialty store, um, but go, you can go try them out. And then if you find better deals uh, like on Camel Fire or something like that, then, then get one. Uh, but don't leave home on a trip without some way of communicating with people. Um, so we'll get right into the types of habitat to look at when you're Again, we're going to focus on elk hunting today uh, for elk hunting. Um, we've had quite a bit of fires in the last few years, some more tragic than others, but don't overlook recently burned areas. Um, we've been very blessed with a lot of monsoon moisture this year that have really allowed some of these burn areas to bounce back fairly quickly. And elk love all of that new growth that comes in after a recently burned uh, area. There's lots of new grasses and forbs and, and they're mostly grazers, but there's lots of food in there that's high protein that they're gonna go in after, after a burn. So look at those areas and, and concentrate around the edges and stuff of a recently burned area. Even if it's post burn, you know, even a decade ago, it's still gonna have vegetation in there that other older, more, you know, older ecosystems are not gonna have. So they're gonna concentrate on the, the one that has more variety from a recently burned area. Uh, look for water and wallows. Um, I know certain units right now are bombarded <laughs> with water, so you're not gonna have a problem, but as things start drying out, um, this is gonna be key, especially for your mid season hunts when it does start drying out. Um, obviously it's just like anybody else, if you get thirsty, you're gonna go find water. Um, but especially this time of year in early season and, and rut, um, those elk love, those bulls love to be in wallows. So if you find one, um, go look at the perimeter of the wallow, see how much it's being used. Um, if it looks like it's just completely covered up in tracks, that is a key thing right there that, hey, this is something to look at um, as part of your hunt agenda mm -hmm. is checking those wallows um, and maybe sitting one. Uh, it could be very conducive for a harvest. So check out that kind of stuff. Like I talked about earlier, those edge areas, um, you know, elk are kind of creatures of habit. They like to come out of, of the trees to feed. And then as the day starts warming up and as the sun starts getting higher, they're gonna start moving back into the timber. But they love the edges where you have a variation of uh, the timber, some meadows, um, some scrubby areas. So if you look at areas kind of like this, this is a recently burned area over by Snow Lake. Um, they really like to congregate in some of these, these areas. And so look for habitat that looks like this because it's got a lot of variety. It's literally got everything an elk needs. It's got food, water cover, space, uh, you know, so they don't have to go very far. And so they're going to concentrate there if there's not a lot of pressure. This is so true, Jennifer, because um, that very picture, I know exactly where that's at. And I found elk there um, just hanging out and feeding and having a yep. good time. So good for you. Yeah. <laughs> so I can confirm that <laughs> that is a good spot to go. <laughs> Um, the next one too, uh, depending upon if this is more of a late season thing to be looking for is these aspen uh, logs or branches. When, when elk start running out of really good forage, they kind of go to the next best thing. It's kind of like when you're standing in the pantry and all the good stuff's gone, um, then you're going to take the next or the very last possible thing you're going to snack on. So that's kind of what this is doing for elk. Is, but if you do see this on your late season hunts, they, those elk are in there, they're utilizing um, that aspen stand. And so concentrate some of your efforts there um, instead of maybe other areas. So now we're gonna get into um, looking at what does some of this habitat look like from e-scouting? And so uh, I'm gonna stop my screen share 
but I want real quick, but I wanted to just show you the, the game unit map. That way you guys kind of know how the state is laid out um, based on game units and, and what you might want to apply for. Um, and we'll get more into that kind of stuff at later conversations as we get closer to the draw. Um, but these are some of the companies that are available to you for the e-scouting and or when you're on the ground um, mapping. We have the base map, Onyx, Google Earth, and the, the carry map. And I know that um, I'm not, no, none of us are very familiar with carry map, but it is free. Um, and, but because based on free, it can be limited, but if that's your budget, it's a good one to use. So make sure you have something um, downloaded on your phone. Um, what's nice about base map and Onyx is it does have offline capabilities. So if you're a subscriber, um, you can download maps and then you don't need internet. You just download it and then go in offline mode and it's there. So I will stop this and allow uh, Colleen, um, since you're the Onyx guru, I don't, I don't know if guru is the word, but thank you. <laughs> but, but just a little, I guess, comments on that too. Um, hang on, we got one quick question in the chat of if we can talk about elevation and temperature too. Cassie, I will get into that in just a second. We're, I'm going to kind of show you how we do some e-scouting ahead of time because let's face it, we are super busy people and we cannot get out where our hunt unit is every weekend or every day you know, things come up, life is busy. And so this is some really, really good tools that you can start doing in advance, way in advance before your hunt um, to kind of prep you before you go and do some physical scouting because physical scouting is just as, if not more important than the e-scouting. This is just kind of the first step. But some of those map options that are available, like Google Earth is free, Carry Map is free. It's mostly... Um, BLM maps that are, are on there. There's a little bit of forest service, but a lot of elk habitat is in forest service country. Um, but there's a lot of really good resources out there for you guys. So that's probably, I would say one of the biggest questions we have been getting um, you know, to our call center, to our offices, people coming into our offices, asking if we have maps. Uh, what kind of maps do we have available? They drew XYZ unit, where do I go? And given our maps on our website are, are slightly limited because we give you the unit boundary and the descriptions and kind of some general unit, but I'm a detail oriented person. I wanna know exactly what tree I need to go sit by. Um, and if, if it's the wrong tree, I need to know what tree not to sit by too. So um, I'm gonna do a little screen share and kind of walk you through Onyx, um, which is something that we use quite a bit um, but if you joined us on our last Lady Social Hour, um, you know that you got an Onyx subscription. So we're going to kind of show you how to put that to use um, and some of the features that are available in it. So um, because I cover the Southwest area and Stephanie is soon on her elk hunt, we're going to kind of focus, I guess, on the Southwest area um, just to kind of do this walkthrough. So let's see. Um, somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see this map. Okay, cool. So um, one of the first things that I do is I kind of figure out where my hunt area is. So looking at this, it just looks like a general map, right? But if I come up to hunt layers and I've got New Mexico downloaded, I can turn on this New Mexico GMUs. And you see that green line that just popped up now breaks down for me all the different game management units um, that I can focus on or worry about and make sure when I download these maps too, that that layer is turned on because when you download those maps and you're offline and you're in the middle of the Gila, you wanna make sure that you're staying within your unit boundary. You don't wanna get in trouble for hunting a different unit. So that's why it's super important to know where you are and where you're going. Um, so looking at this, you know, there's a lot of different things um, that I'm looking for too initially. So kind of to orient you guys, um, Reserve is gonna be right up here. This is the Western side of the state. Silver City is just south of here. Um, the green that you see, as I kind of zoom in, um, that is US Forest Service property. This kind of speckled grayed out zone is wilderness. The yellow is Bureau of Land Management. The bluish kind of green is uh, New Mexico state land, state trust land, and then just 
and white or clear is private property. Just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm looking for. So the cool thing was unit 16A, a lot of it, a lot, 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 lot of it is public. So you have a lot of access points. You have a lot of country to cover. You shouldn't have any issues. You know, when you bump into other hunters, there are plenty of other places to go. Um, so I kind of look of, okay, cool. I've got a lot of places to work with in my unit. And that also helps me in picking my unit when I apply to. I'm not going to apply in a unit that I might have limited access or is, um, I, I, I just may not have somewhere to go. Then I also kind of consider where I'm going to be coming in from, from Las Cruces. I'm going to probably be coming, you know, uh, from the Silver City route. If I'm coming from Albuquerque, I may be coming through um, Daddle kind of country. So I kind of look at where I'm going to be coming in from. What can I hunt that's close? How are the roads looking? And every September, every year, it never fails. We get our monsoon seasons and roads get tremendously washed out. So just because it shows me that there might be roads here doesn't mean I have great access. That's why it's just as important to go and do that physical boots on the ground scouting to see what kind of condition those roads are in and how you need to access certain areas. Um, another cool layer that's on here too that I like to point out um, is, let's see if I can find it on here, oh, not that one. And let me also add to, depending on what membership level you have, you're gonna see different, you're gonna have different features available to you. Um, so not everything is gonna be open for me. Um, uh, trees, crops and cover. Okay, so there's the second tab on here says historic wildfire. Jennifer just mentioned that elk love this old fire kind of habitat. It brings in a lot of new growth. Um, some aspen groves will tremendously come up and a lot of deer and elk love those new baby aspens to eat. Um, so if I turned this tab on, you're gonna see a different layer pop up on the map in different colors. And it even shows me what year those fires took place. So I've got 2021, 2018, 2016, 2012. Um, if I back out a little bit too, um, let's see if it showed, it doesn't show the recent um, black fire. That's actually in a different tab. Oh, I could also turn on um, if I had the membership level, <laughs> um, different open gate properties, um, unitized ranches. So if you drew a elk license. You have permission to hunt a private property who is enrolled in the E plus program who has opted for the open or unit wide options. We have a list of that on our website. I'm not going to go into super detail about that, but in a lot of these places, you don't need it because there's so much public to hit. Um, but I wanted to find this fire one. See, I told you I was not like the expert expert. I found it earlier and now I'm not sure where I put, oh, current conditions, active wildfires, there we go. So see how all of that just turned red. Um, it is not an active wildfire at this point, but because the US Forest Service is still working on it, that's how it's still kind of showing up on the map. So I can kind of see where that boundary of the fire was. So I'm gonna actually turn that back off. Um, but you see it overlapped a lot of those old fires and such too. So, you know, I can go in and zoom in to some of these areas and see really what those fires looked like. Um, when you start to get too many layers in here, it does kind of muddy things up um, and makes it kind of hard to see actually the, what things really look like. So I, I am going to turn it off and I'm going to show you how I toggle back and forth between some different features that are on here. So I can get kind of a better lay of the land, I guess. So I know all of this was burned area because I just turned that layer off. But as I zoom in more, all of these little speckled lines are trails or roads. Um, a very, very important thing to make sure you check before you leave on your hunt um, is looking at the motor vehicle use map for that forest. Every forest is gonna have one. A lot of these roads that you see on here are no longer in service and they're closed roads. 
but they're still going to show on the map. Just because they're here on the map does not mean that you can go in those areas. So, and especially with the recent fires, recent floods, you want to make sure that you're double checking that vehicle use map before you leave on your hunt. Um, it is something that you get from the Forest Service. Um, uh, Colleen, how yep. accurate is the um, layer for the Forest Service roads on here? according to the MV. So I can even zoom in a little like further on here and you can see some of them. Um, obviously with some timber um, and height in here, it's gonna make it a little harder to see some of those little two track roads. And because if any of them are closed and have been closed for some time, they may not show as well on the, the satellite feature here. Um, but I mean, on um, if you go to layers, you can turn mm -hmm. on the active roads layer. And it'll show up the roads that you can drive on are there you go motorized roads and trails yep um right there light up and so i'm wondering if how accurate some of these are i guess compared to our you know the BUM. from a user standpoint i would say they're fairly accurate um but there are still a lot of roads that i will find on my onyx and my husband uses another um, GPS software that I'm having a brain fart on about at the moment, but he's got the, the roads that are closed um, marked on there that we can't access. And you can always go and add notes on here too. Um, you know, if you go in an area that you really want to maybe hunt, um, but the road's closed, you can drop a marker and be like, hey, this is where I need to park. Um, and then I'm going to hike in on this closed road or something. But um, as far as it telling you that there's a road here, there was at least a road there at one point. It may not be a, a current active road, but let me go back. Um, While you're navigating that real quick, Colleen, I wanted to just touch base on the roads is that a lot of folks will say, well, I was in my hunt unit and it didn't really look like it was a very well-traveled road, but there was still a two track there. So if it is still a two track and it's not officially closed, you can use that for hunting just as long as it was it looked like it was used prior to hunting. So don't don't second guess yourself about, oh, I can't use that road because, you know, there's there's some vegetation on it. As long as it looks like there was use on that road prior to hunting, then that is an accessible road, and especially if it wasn't. Part of that travel management plan plan as a closed road so right um so yeah it, going back to the, at least the area and picking kind of the areas that i want to get into um you know i kind of look at where i'm going to be coming in from is there good roads to at least get somewhere and then i kind of start looking at the map and you know a lot of these elk in in the gila are all over the gila um so really kind of picking any of these spots it, it, you're not you're not going to start in a bad place unless you start in some really big, nasty, rocky mountain or rocky canyon. Um, but the Gila is pretty user friendly. So, you know, I can start by zooming into some of these places. I'm going to be looking at the roads. Number one, to see how the roads look. And if it actually looks like a road, like as I zoom in on what it says Bursum Road here, this is a bladed, maintained road. Um, I've been on it several times. I'm familiar with the quality of it. So I know I can branch off from certain areas on this. Um, and as I'm just kind of checking out country, I'm going to be, you know, kind of zooming in, looking to see what the terrain looks like, uh, what the cover looks like. And most importantly, because I predominantly archery hunt and hunt in early season. So my biggest concern is I want to find water. All I care about is I want to find water. I want to see where, if I have to set up somewhere, if I have to hike in somewhere, what are elk going to be using? And that way, when I go out to physically scout, I can check all these waters in advance. Number one, see if there's water in it, because just because this burnt cabin tank says that there's water in it in this satellite image, you may get there and it'd be completely dried up. So that's why it's important to get those boots on the ground and double check those too. Maybe I want to put a camera. Um, maybe I need to figure out if I need to set a blind, if it's a problem area, if it's too close to a road and I'm going to be covered up in people, um, I want to be mindful of those kinds of things too. So I can go and drop, um, a pin on here. So I just hit add marker 
Um, there are lots of options here. You know, if it was a blind or maybe you found a elk shed, it's a feeding area. There's lots of kind of cool little icons that Onyx has on here too. Um, I use water source probably the most often, and then I like to mark them blue on my map. So I relate blue and water together. And so when I zoom out on my map, I can see kind of a pattern of where these water sources are. And I can also move from water source to water source if I have to and put myself kind of in the middle because those elk may go to several of those water sources. So I would just click save. As I back out of here, now that's that marker is added. Um, and a lot of water sources are also marked or labeled sometimes on here. Um, of course, I just zoomed in on one that didn't have one, but you saw that burnt cabin had a name on there. Um, I'm gonna pan out and go to another spot real quick too. So you see all these little springs and water sources. Um, not every water source is gonna be marked on your map. So you may be hiking and come across a water source and be like, oh, this isn't on my map, I'm gonna mark it. If it's not on your map and you found it while you were actually hiking out there, even better because that means whoever's doing only e-scouting doesn't know that that water is there. Um, just kind of a pro tip there. <laughs> um, but here's some others that are, there's a spring here. It looks like there's some water, some more water, Negrito pasture tank, you know, so there's lots of spots like this as you're kind of zooming in and out that you can um, mark some of those. And I just go through and I start marking waters of where I want to check out. So when I do go to scout, I kind of have an idea um, of where I'm going to go or where I'm going to start. And if I get there and I decide, you know what, this is dried up or this is not a spot I want to sit, I delete it off of mine or I make a note. You can make notes about it. You can upload photos into those markers as well. So you can take a photo of what it looked like when you scouted versus maybe when you were back for your hunt um that sort of thing um another cool feature that onyx has um that i use and toggle back a lot is um this 3d option so i'm gonna actually i'm gonna go to a different area because i know it's much steeper <laughs> um so here's elk mountain um there may be elk here it's Elk Mountain for Pete's sake. But um, just looking at this, I can't get a good feel for the terrain. Um, I may not want to hike almost 10,000 feet to the top of it to chase elk. So I can turn on the 3D map option and it's gonna change my perspective that now I can kind of see a little bit more of the terrain um, and the way it's laid out. And I can zoom in, I can get, you know, a lot more detail. I can see it's pretty rocky on the south side. And given using, I also like to do a lot of this on the computer versus on my phone. You can log in onto Onyx on your computer and do all of this is what I'm doing right now. Um, so you don't have to use it just on your phone. Um, but as I'm coming in and looking at some areas too, earlier I found a couple tanks in here. But I kind of want to get a feel for, okay, if there's water in this area, um, where might some bedding sites be? Where might, there we go. Where might some feeding areas be? They like to come out and graze in, in open areas, um, but when they go to bed, they're going to be going for cover. So finding areas that have food, water, cover, and space is all you really need to look for. And I, I know that's probably easier said than done, but here's a really good example. There's two uh, water sources. There's one here, one down lower here. They are likely gonna be going uphill to bed. They're gonna play a lot of those thermals and the temperature to their favor. So you gotta kind of pay attention to that too, especially during archery season, of playing the wind to your favor. Um, they have a very, very good nose on them. So you want to make sure that you're not sending all of this human scent straight into their bedding areas, make them nervous, stay up and leave and go somewhere else. So always play the windier advantage. I like to carry a little wind checker bottle of it's unscented powder um, and you can just squeeze it a little bit and it'll tell you which direction the wind's going. 
Um, and it may completely change your plans that you have to now go all the way around much further to play the wind right, but it'll definitely help in the success of your hunt, no matter what you're hunting, not just elk, but any, any species using the wind to your advantage is, is key. Um, is there a question? I, my, it looks like the chat's blowing up, but I don't have it open. Is there questions on this stuff that I can answer? Not really any questions. There was just some, some good comments about, um, you know, making sure that you're on, on the right roads and, and calling the Forest Service for the most up-to-date closures that are based on fire impact um, or if they've been washed out. So the Forest Service is your best. Um, call the district ahead of time. Um, for your best resource on, on, on those roads. And yep. then uh, Kira also had a really good comment about um, the, if you download, if you need a map, um, download the most detailed map as possible for your offline maps. Um, because then once you get in an area, then you're only going to have like what you recently downloaded. So thanks Kira for that tip too. Absolutely. Um, another good option too, is you can always call the Forest Service office, visit with them on, you know, if there's maybe some potential closures coming up. I know we're really focusing on elk right now, but it is especially true for spring turkey season. You know, that's a, a the start of a lot of prescribed burn season that time of year too, um, or, or shortly after turkey season opens. So it's good to at least ask like, hey, is there going to be any closures coming up in the area that I'm planning to go? Um, you can always touch base with um, a district officer or an area officer uh, for the Department of Game and Fish and get an idea on, on any kind of conditions or info or how things are going, how things are looking out there too. You know, it's an additional source of information, but this is really how I start e-scouting. I, I kind of get an idea of where to go and kind of get myself familiar with names of places and maybe road numbers um, and just kind of get familiar this way. And then, so when I go in to actually boots on the ground scout, I have a much better idea of where to go and what to do instead of aimlessly wander through the mountains, which is perfectly fine too. You find a lot of cool stuff that way. Um, but I like going in with a plan. <laughs> I'm, I'm a plan kind of person. Uh, I'll just add, I would call multiple agencies. So I would like the, for example, when I was going on this grouse hunt, I had called the forest service and they told me this road was closed that I wanted to go on. So I was totally bummed out. Um, I actually called the district officer as well to talk to him about some conditions. And he said, nope, that road is open. I was just on it two days ago. So it, you might want to call multiple people because um, it, it may pan out. Yep. Um, another good thing too, let me, this is a very good example of why I toggle back between 2D and 3D because things kind of get a little weird. Um, when there are places of private, um, you know, obviously, if you don't have permission to hunt those areas, don't hunt them. Um, my, oh, private lands are too now. For some reason, it's not um, telling me my ownership. Let me find somewhere else. Um, but if you are hunting in an area, you know, and there is private nearby and you shoot an animal and, um, you know, goes off in, to private, oh my gosh, now what? Like, how do I even know who it is? Who do I contact? Um, Onyx does usually give um, land ownership on here too. And of course, as I'm trying to tell it, I'm not having luck of it popping up. Usually it just pops up. Um, let me go to an area that has a lot more private. But it, that way, if you do need to get a hold of somebody, you can. Um, I may not have this layer turned on right or something because that should be popping up. Um, and if you can't get a hold of that landowner, at least trying to get a hold of the uh, conservation officer in the area, you can tell them, hey, according to my map, it ran on to Mr. Smith's place. If you have contact info for him, will you help me get in touch with him so I can go and recover my animal? Um, so that it's a useful tool on there too. It works. That part apparently works better on my phone than on the computer. It's having a day. And of course the gremlins are trying to take over on it. But I hope that answers some questions, at least on, on at least starting to e-scout. Make sure that you're scouting in the right unit that your hunt is. Um, and this really helps even when I go to prepare to um, do my applications also, 
I do some e-scouting ahead of time to be like, hey, is this unit even worth looking at or applying for? Um, and give me kind of some more idea about it too. So those are the kind of areas that I'm looking for um, and things that I'm looking at when I'm e-scouting. So habitat is key. A look at those fire areas. I'm looking for bedding areas and I'm looking for water is, is a really key point. If I can find water, there's gonna be elk nearby. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and we can go back to presentation. So I've rambled enough. Sorry, Colleen, can you touch on those bedding areas? What are you looking for in bedding areas again? So usually with bedding areas, I'm gonna be looking for areas that have water nearby and then has some sort of elevation up. Um, elk usually are not gonna come low from the water to bed. They're usually gonna come low from the water to feed. Or they're gonna come out into those grassy areas. Um, elk are much more of, of grazers, kind of like cattle than deer are. Deer are much more browsers. I, I kind of like to compare it to um, if you handed elk uh, ice cream sundae, they're going to eat the entire thing. They're not going to be picky and they're just going to eat it all. Deer are going to be picky and eat the cherry and eat the sprinkles and that's all I want to have and I'm going to move on and they'll leave all the other stuff. So um, I'm going to be looking e-scouting and especially when I go more boots on the ground scouting um, for bedding areas. I'm going to look for those water areas and I'm going to look, kind of see if there is some elevation. If there's little hilltops or ridges, they're going to go bed on those hilltops and ridges. Number one, it gives them a visual advantage that they can look down and see anything that's coming. The second thing is their sense of smell. Those thermals are going to be changing. And so with wind and the thermal coming uphill, they're gonna smell anything that's coming up towards them too. So they really like bedding up on those ridges where there's cover, where there's shade, especially in those hot times. Um, they're gonna to wanna to go find somewhere that they can see, they can smell and they have some shade and take a big old hard nap for the part of the day. Um, when scouting, how far in advance do you start boots on the ground scouting? Um, usually I would say at least within a month before my hunt. Um, and that I'm so glad you asked that too, because it was something that I wrote down that I wanted to hit on as, as far as being mindful, but, um, before my hunt starts, I want to get out there at least a month in, a, in advance, especially it, if not two months, especially if I'm running game cameras, if I'm putting cameras up, I want to be able to go back out a couple more times to check those cameras and see if I need to move them, to see if anything's coming on them, if I can pattern those animals that are coming in on camera and kind of get an idea. Um, but if I have very limited time to get out, I wanna get out at least a month to three weeks before my hunt starts. And I know that's still a lot of time. A lot of things can change in that amount of time also, um, especially right now, like these September archery hunts, you know, the rut starting, Things are gonna change from day to day with rut behavior, um, but also especially with monsoons. We just had a huge flood a couple of weeks ago, or I guess it's been about a month ago now, um, where there was water everywhere. And so it would be pointless to go and try to find water holes because they're not gonna be consistently coming into water holes. Well, if it's hot and dry, that's especially when I'm going to be wanting to find more of those water holes and maybe sit some of those areas too. Um, so I would give it at least a couple of weeks before I get boots on the ground. But the big thing that I wanted to hit on that I wrote down in my notes here, and I'm glad that you asked, is if you have hunts coming up that you have not started scouting for, please, please be mindful of other hunters who are currently hunting. There is an archery elk hunt currently going on right now that ends tomorrow and it never fails that people that have maybe the second hunt are going in right now to start scouting or go check this water tank or let me go check out these areas and they're causing conflicts with current hunters. Um, I've, I've had it happen to me in the past. I actually just had it happen on my hunt last week um, where you're running into other hunters that are maybe coming to scout or maybe they're coming to hunt doves or bears or something else. And now it's like, hey man, like there's plenty of other places to go. Um, 
you know, we're, we're here. And so it's a kind of an ethical thing too. There's lots of public land out there. You know, if somebody was there first, give them the courtesy back out of there and let them enjoy what's left of their hunt. So just be very mindful of the hunts that are currently going on before you go out and scout. Um, and don't put yourself in, in a dangerous situation too, um, especially during rifle season. Um, how do we know other hunt dates in the areas? The proclamation is your Bible. Um, you can check. Uh, so if it's elk, actually, if it's any species, you can look up, say, Unit 16A, because we've just been talking about that. It's going to list all of the hunt dates for me in the unit, and I can look and see, okay, there's a hunt going on the 1st through the 14th. The next hunt starts the next day on the 15th. Um, so you can see all the different hunt dates that are on there. By looking at the proclamation, if you don't have a hard copy, you can download it on our website, um, or you can give our, our area office a call to and just double check that way as well if you want to know specific dates. So. Yep, you can also look at species. So there might be concurrent deer hunts going on during an elk yes. hunt as well. So yep. you can look at the species um, tabs and find it, find out you know what other species are being hunted at that same time in that unit, because um, that is a pretty common thing to 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 occur. So um, and kind of bouncing back to Tim's scouting question is the sometimes you don't want to get there too early. So if you drew a 16A rifle hunt in December. You don't want to go right now. Uh, right. You might want to go just to get a lay of the land of where the roads are and maybe what it looks like if you've never been to that unit. But those elk patterns are going to completely change between now and December. Um, and depending upon the extremity of how much snow is, is there, if we even are lucky to get snow, or where are they going to be in elevation. Um, so kind of look at that kind of stuff too, and don't get out there so early, go, go, go scout now and then think everything's going to be exactly the same come December. So same if with deer hunting, you're scouting in September for, for deer, for mule deer, and your tag is not until January, totally different patterning. So don't go so terribly early that it's not really doing you any good if you're trying to look at actual animal behavior. So such a good point. And especially right now with elk. You know, it's it's rut season, it's breeding season, which we're going to get to here in a second. Um, their their behavior right now is going to be totally different than their behavior in, in December. Um, you're going to find those bulls are going to break off from those big harems and those big herds, and they're going to kind of bachelor back up or they might be solo. So depending on the time of year is totally going to change how you hunt and when you start scouting. But yeah, too far in advance doesn't help you for your hunt too, because there's different things going on for that species of time. And I'm so glad Jen mentioned about different species too, because you can definitely run in to different deer hunters or um, elk hunters or whatever. So. Yeah, and especially bear, a lot of bear hunters overlap with many different species. So you could have several different species hunting at the same time. I know uh, Colleen and I were talking during her deer hunt, she had dove hunters come in on her and then there's bear hunters and you have deer hunters and then <laughs> so it's public land and it's great, but after a while, it can be a little frustrating too. So, but just know that, I mean, we possibly could have done that to somebody else and not even realize it. So, <laughs> but thank you, Colleen. That was great. Good tips on Onyx. Um, so part of your scouting pre prep planning, that's hard to say. I had to think about that. Pre prep planning. Um, is is cameras. If you decide to use cameras, um, they're a great resource, but it can take a lot of extra time. Um, it's an extra added expense. Um, and sometimes people can be so incredibly lovely in the field and they steal your stuff. Um, so there is some concerns that you'll need to have about securing your cameras, um, especially if they're on water holes um, that are closer to roads. Um, but a lot of the times if you're doing your e-scouting, you get out there, boots on the ground, you find a seep or a spring, and it's not located on any kind of maps, and it doesn't look like there's been a lot of traffic in there, that's a pretty good indication that you're the only one potentially who might have found that, or there's very few people who know about that spot, and you're going to be less apt to have people mess with your stuff. But for elk camera tips, um, try to use both of those settings, picture and video. Um, and again, there's so many different types of trail cameras out there. Just know that for New Mexico, the cellular cameras are not legal. So it needs to just take the, that and, and house that 
um, picture or video in, in the camera and it can't send you text messages or all of that fun stuff. Um, but if you have the capabilities of running two different settings, that's super helpful because sometimes the shutter speed or the trigger speed is what they call it is not very good. And so you get the back half of an animal. You're like, was that a bull? Was that a cow? What was that? I have no idea. So sometimes that video will capture that too. Um, face the trail camera either north to east. Remember your sun settings. I <laughs> have learned this the hard way to where, oh, this is a great place to set a camera. And I didn't even think about the sun angle and it took 2000 pictures. And a lot of it, the sun will trigger <laughs> your camera. And so that's super fun going through 2000 camera or pictures of nothing. <laughs> so, or I could have maybe had a deer or whatever on there. And I have no idea because it was like the sun. <laughs> so think about that, be mindful. Or one of the things that I have also learned is when you're setting your camera and you have a lot of, especially now with all the vegetation, you have grass, it's waist high, trim some of that down because that's going to be moving and setting off the trigger on your trail camera. So try to, I'm not saying pulling everything out of the roots and, and just totally massacring everything, but just kind of trim it down to where it's not just constantly moving and, and, and making your trail camera ca catch pictures of grass and flowers blowing in the wind. Um, set your sensitivity to low, because again, if you don't set it low, you're it's gonna capture a picture. You're like, what was that? And it was the animal already walked by. And so now you've got two pictures of nothing. Um, so, Think about that. I set up trail cameras in my backyard. <laughs> I let my dog set it off. I want to know what that trigger speed is. I know want to know what the sensitivity is. You know, what, how is it going to work? Is it, is a piece of junk and do I need to return it? Or, hey, this is a really good camera. I've got some cheaper trail cameras that I actually like better than some of my high, higher dollar trail cameras. So um, play around with those and, and have fun with it. <laughs> um, Target those water, water or the wallows, uh, fence crossings, uh, uh, trails that go to and from a bedding area. Um, it's really hard to capture elk in a bedding area um, just because they, they use those thermals and it's really hard to sneak up on a, an elk in their bedding area. So if you do have some pictures of them and then you can be um, mindful of how to get into that area without being detected, that's gonna be super beneficial during the mid part of the day where most people just go back to camp and have lunch and take a nap. Um, if you know they're going in there consistently during a bedding area and you know how to get in there, um, now you're using your entire hunt day instead of just morning and evening. So it's opening um, opportunities up for you. Um, and then just consider the security on that. Um, they make lots of different anti-theft boxes you can buy online for a myriad of different trail cameras. And I highly recommend to lock up your stuff anymore. Unfortunately, that's just the way society's going. Um, here's just a trail camera picture that I stole off the internet. Um, but I thought it was pretty cool because it was capturing this animal. Um, really good detail. Um, you can see that it's an early season elk and it gives you the time. Always be mindful of how you set your date and time. <laughs> I've forgotten to do that too. And I'm like, I know it's not 4 a.m. because the sun's out. So um, so just make sure you're capturing the your setting, your settings are correct before you actually walk away from your camera um, because it's super helpful to know the patterns of if they're coming to and from a, a water source on a trail consistently between eight and ten in the morning, you know you when you need to be in there to intercept that animal. So it, it can be super helpful. Jennifer, can you um, tell everyone what a wallow is, just in case there are some out there that don't know? Okay, yeah, I'll go back here just if it'll let me, not letting me go back. Here we go. So I'm going to go back to uh, this one. So this is just an example of a wallow. You can see how it's like a puddle of water with a bunch of mud around it. Sometimes you'll find... Um, like a, a old dirt tank that has had a lot of water in it, but the middle has some good water and then it's just a big mud hole around it. Bull elk love to roll around in a wallow and they're spreading their scent and, and they're, they're getting themselves all yucky and that's just what they like to do. So if you find a little mud hole like this or they can be way bigger, they can even be smaller, but those bulls will get in, in that wallow. It's like a pig wallowing around in the mud. 
Um, so if you find stuff like that, you'll see a lot of elk tracks in it. And that's a really great place to be, um, especially during the, the breeding, the pre-rut and the rut. Good question. Um, next part. I also have another question. Are bolt-on boxes legal or do you have, or do they have to be secured using straps and cables? Uh, you can do bolts, cables, straps, it, it doesn't matter. Um, there are no legalities on how to adhere that uh, camera to the tree. So, good questions. Uh, another part of your scouting and or during your hunt is, is glassing that area. Um, the one little picture there is when you basically what you want to do is get up high where you can see not I mean you're not currently going to be able to do 360 but a good portion of your hunt area or down into some good basins and stuff where you can see elk going up or down um, depending upon the time of day that you're sitting um, but you're you're trying to glass up elk um, archery hunts if you see elk and oh I see them they're two miles away um, <laughs> that's two miles as the crow flies so you also have to consider how long is it going to take me to get from point A to point B um, and if it's uh, feasible for you to do that. Um, rifle hunting can sometimes be a little different um, but consider the time of day um, how far those animals are and how realistically you're going to be able to do that, um, especially if you get one on the ground. So um, just consider a lot of that, but find out where the animals are and um, then make a game plan. Um, and basically you're just going to pick apart an area. And what I mean by pick apart is you'll have your binoculars either on your tripod or something steady. You can have your elbows on your knees or find a rock or your pack, or, and you're just literally going to look and grid apart things close and far away and just be meticulous in whatever method that you want to use but you know scan the easy stuff first and then you're just going to pick that landscape apart bit by bit to see if you especially if elk are in their bedding areas it's super hard to find them in the timber because they're not moving around a whole lot so um but that's just uh, so an, uh, a part that can help you, especially in, in the doldrums of the middle of the day, find a, a high place and, and just start glassing. And, and you can get a lay of the land too by looking at Onyx and say, hey, this looks like a good area where they could be bedded. Um, and maybe you can glass them coming out at, at night to feed. Uh, tracks is a key thing. Just because you don't actually physically see the animal um, doesn't mean that they're not there. So here's just a comparison of what an elk track looks like. The, the elk tracks are in the sand. You can see how pointy they are, a little more narrow. And then on the other picture, that's a picture of a cow, a moo cow, <laughs> not an elk cow. So you can see how round it is, how wide it is, circular. So the domestic cow is going to look just like that. Um, and when you're at a water hole, that's when it can be a little hard to tell the difference between, is this an elk? Is this a, a cow? What is it? So if it's super round, it's definitely going to be your bovine. Um, and of course, the bigger the animal, the heavier that crack is going to be in the ground. And if you're looking at a big bull or a big buck, it's going to have those new claws behind it. I couldn't really find a very good picture. So, um, but and then of course if you see a lot of these types of tracks um and then smaller tracks maybe that's cows and calves and so that might be a good place to look at um in the in the middle of the rut because if you're seeing a lot of cow and calf activity those bulls are going to be trying to to round them up uh, for breeding look for the poop <laughs> get the scoop on the poop uh so your elk scat is going to be larger round um the, I like to show two different pictures. A lot of people don't realize that elk can poop in like big piles and depend on the moisture content, um, how it's gonna look when it comes out. And so if they're eating a lot of um, really dense, uh, wet uh, vegetation, it's gonna look more like the darker picture, clumpy on the right. And then as things start drying out, their forage is drying out, then what comes out of them is gonna be a lot drier as well. And so then be more pelletized. And so um, that's a couple different ways of, of looking at, at elk poop. 
then rubs these you're going to start seeing those now most definitely even not earlier in the season elk start rubbing to get all that velvet off they're marking their territory they're trying to say hey i'm here um i'm bigger than you um you know all that kind of stuff and so all that testosterone is going and they're going to rub on all sorts of stuff um just because it's a tiny little sapling doesn't always mean it's going to be that little rag horn or a spike um I have seen some very nice shootable bull elk rub on the tiniest little sapling. And so don't overlook those types. Just because this like big bull right here is raking a big tree um, doesn't mean he's gonna rake anything else that he finds in his way. So don't always pass up some of it, but look for this stuff, look for how fresh it is. If it's still really wet and sticky like the sap, then that's a really fresh rub. Um, and then of course, as it sits, in the elements over time, then that stuff's going to start drying out and look old. So this right here of the juniper all raked up is, is a fairly fresh picture. Um, and then the one in, of the little jack pine is, is a little bit older. So it'll also tell you how recent that that occurred. But if you see rubs in an area, old or new, that's probably a good place to be. Uh, a couple of you guys were asking about um, kind of what do I need to be looking for as far as temperature or daily patterns. And so, you know, basically what's an elk's daily routine look like? They're going to feed early in the morning, in the evening. Um, they're going to go uh, and find a bedding area midday when it's hot. And plus they're going to sit there and, and digest everything that they ate in the morning. Um, in the hot weather, they're going to probably bed down longer. They're going to go into that shade just like us. It's like if it's hot, I don't want to be in the in the sun. Um, and so they're going to find find places to get out of the heat or pressure. Um, that's another big one. A lot of hunter pressure will push them deeper into those bedding areas. Um, they're just trying to find sanctuary. Um, if the weather's colder, they're going to feed later in the morning um, and leave their beds earlier as well. Um, some people are hung up on moon phases and they swear by it. Um, I, I don't know always if it's true. Um, I think full moons, they definitely um, stay out feeding later for sure, but I don't know if it's a 100% thing with, I haven't really found it with deer as much, um, but I don't know. Um, it's just one of those things. It probably does affect it to a certain degree, but I don't think it's just a, a dead set thing um, that you should, oh, it's a full moon, my hunt's gonna suck. No, don't go by that. Um, and then hunting pressure, now that's a real thing. Um, if you find a group of elk and then there's other hunters in that area, um, they're probably gonna bump them out, but that could be to your advantage. Um, maybe you can intercept that group as they're being pressured by another group of hunters. And so take note of that, and it definitely could work to your advantage. Um, just for sake of time, because I saw <laughs> it's almost seven o'clock, um, the five periods of elk hunting, um, I, I, we can send this, this link to you. It's a really good informative video. Um, it's super short, it's about five minutes, but it kind of goes through the pre-rut all the way to late season and gives you some really handy tips on that. So we'll make sure that everybody's uh, on session with us tonight um, gets a copy of that. Can you drop um, it in the chat too, Jen? Yeah, I can definitely do that as well, uh, for sure. But I know you guys have more things to do this evening than just sit here and listen to us. <laughs> I mean, you guys are cooking dinner while you're listening to us, so kudos to you. Um, so we'll go into some elk calling tips. Um, first, First thing is a lot of folks say, man, I just can't figure this elk calling out. Every time I call, I don't ever get a response. Well, maybe you're calling and there are no elk there. <laughs> so there's nobody to talk to. So they're not gonna talk back to you. Um, a lot of the times in the pre-rut and the rut, those bulls are gonna give you the silent treatment. He already has a harem of cows. He doesn't want anybody to know where he's at to come steal them. And so he's just gonna be quiet. Um, a lot of the times, if you keep pressuring this bull, he's going to move them far, far away from you, um, especially if it's a smaller bull or he's just tired and doesn't want to deal with it anymore. So they'll give you that silent treatment. So a lot of the times, if you hear a bugle and you try to talk back to him and he shuts up, just pinpoint the location and try to get in there as 
sneakily as possible without calling back. If they're not talking, then don't talk back to them um, because they you run the risk of uh, pushing them farther away from you. The next one is um, maybe you have an unfavorable position. Um, I kind of like this drawing or this diagram that I found because it shows kind of a diagram of how maybe you get set up. Um, it's sorry if it's tiny, tiny. I tried to make it big, but um, you can see that elk is kind of uh, up up above um, where the hunter is. A lot of folks make mistakes of um, trying to call an elk up to them. And so they're calling and bugling and being super aggressive above that bull. And that's pretty intimidating. That's an intimidating stance for another animal. So their chances of them coming up to you are not very fruitful at all. If you are below them, to draw them down to you and they're coming into your wind, um, that could be tricky. Um, but they're more apt to come down to you because again, I mean, animals are lazy. It's like, why do I want to go all the way uphill? It's like, no. <laughs> or you can find a shelf area kind of in the middle and then try to call that because a lot of the times the elk might come up and hang up on a shelf and decide, no, you are not worth my effort. I'm stopping. Um, so just know your position and, and call as, as needed if, if, but they're not gonna really make a commitment to come all the way up a hill to you. It's super, super rare. Um, the next one is just competition, especially in the middle of the rut. Um, they might not come to you if they're constantly getting talked at by other satellite bulls trying to steal their harem. Um, so sometimes you might be able to call a satellite bull over to you. Um, that definitely is very likely. Um, but at the same time, uh, your, your chances of pulling another big bull away when he's getting bombarded <laughs> by a bunch of teenagers is probably not going to happen. So um, it can definitely be challenging um, to get in on this situation because look at all those eyes, um, especially if you're an archery hunter, there's a lot of eyes looking at you. Um, if you can have a rifle or a muzzleloader hunt, um, that's going to definitely not be as bad of a situation or as challenging, I should say. But just be mindful of, of all those different eyes um, looking at you to bust you. Um, but you might be able to call that satellite in and have an opportunity, um, just as long as you don't sound too terribly aggressive. And get a feel for it. Um, if you're calling and getting a response, then move in a little bit and then do some more calling, um, especially if you get closer to a big bull and it starts sounding like a lost cow or a a super hot cow <laughs> say, look at me and he's going to come possibly check you out. So depending on your situation, that's why you have all those different little calls in your toolbox, because every situation is going to be completely different. And I think that's one thing that people love about elk hunting is it's never the same thing. It's always some kind of challenge that you're going to have to be up against. Um, and it, it does take a lot of practice. Um, anybody um, on the any, any questions on any of this or anything you want to add, uh, Colleen or ladies? Um, we, we had one question in the chat, but I think maybe we'll we'll save it once we get through the elk calling stuff because it's about specific location. Um, okay. Super cool hunt though. We'll want to talk about that. Um, at, at least for elk calling stuff, and maybe it's on the, the next slide. I'm not sure, Jen, but at least my two cents on that is kind of read the room. You know, if, if, there is a lot of bugling going on of bulls going back and forth and you can tell that they're getting a lot more aggressive with each other you know do different kind of cow calls to maybe bring them in or act like another big aggressive bull that's going to come and steal the cows kind yeah. of read the room and read the scenario and by read the room i mean read the mountain um and, and kind of get a different feel for it um don't over call <laughs> Yeah. Um, especially right now too, it is, everyone's going out and trying to see if bulls are bugling and they're trying to use all different types of artificial calls to call an elk and those elk will get call shy. They're going to be like, oh, I know that that is a primos double read, blah, 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 or that's a hoochie mama call. Like they get very call shy. So don't over call either. Um, if you're not getting responses, you know, do a bugle and wait a few minutes. Don't 
keep doing it one after another because then they're going to be like, oh no, I'm not ready for that. I need a moment. Um, and don't just rely on calls. Get in the wallows and or in the ponds and splash around. Break branches. Sound like you're raking a tree. Um, you know, there's there's other sounds that are going to kind of bring them into that. Those bulls are going to be like, oh, hang on, there's a, another bull over there that's going to come and try to take my cows. I need to go be protective. Um, and given a lot of this calling really works predominantly in the rut season, um, but doing like some lost calf calls and, and cow calls late in the season too is also a way to get other elk in um, depending on the type of tag that you have. So, and I know we've mentioned bugles and mews and grunts and all this kind of stuff too. I think maybe in the next slide too, we kind of talk a little bit more about the different types of calls that are there. And as an elk hunter, that is for me, probably the hardest thing is when to do what calls. And it just comes with experience and it comes with practice. Um, you're going to mess up. It's going to be fine, but there's going to be times that it's going to work and you're going to get it too. So um, just keep after it. Um, it. It's okay to, to fail. Um, and then yeah. the other thing too is setting up, if you're hunting with a buddy, um, set up your collar at least 50 to 70 yards behind you or uphill or further away. So they're coming to the call, not coming to the hunter. You want that elk um, to be coming up uh, past your hunter. So uh, especially if you're going to be hunting with, with somebody else. Yeah. And that's what this diagram is trying to illustrate. And there's even a little decoy here is they're calling this bull down hill to them. Callers are back here. Hunters up here. Um, one thing that's really useful too is like Colleen mentioned the raking. Um, that really helps if you see a bull doing that, he's distracted. It will allow you to move up quickly um, while he's distracted for a few minutes and get more into position um, to get a shot, a better shot angle, or even get closer. That's really helpful for your archery hunters. So um, raking is good, is a good thing. So yeah, on the next slide is the calls. Uh, we have several different types. This is your bugle tube, and sometimes it's in, used in conjunction with the diaphragm call. Um, there's an open read call, which is um, a little easier to use for your novice elk hunter or caller. Diaphragms can be a little tricky, take quite a bit of practice. These read calls also take practice, but not quite so much. One of the things that I saw online was a bite call, and I had never heard of that. And I looked into it a little bit, and it allows you to make more nasally cow sounds. I'm like, that is super cool, because it's super hard to sound nasally. And there's a little um, video I'm going to show real quick that talks about that. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard to make with a diaphragm call. Um, and the open read. So it sounds a whole lot more realistic. Um, but of course, your cows are going to mew, chirp, bark, and bugle. Um, yes, cows do bugle. It sounds really odd, <laughs> but it, they do. Um, if you hear them bark, that's not a good sign. That's more of an alert, and the gig is up. Um, so barking is not a good sound. Um, the calves normally stick to just mewing, and um, the bulls will do all of those different types of um, calls. And then there's also a call that they don't really talk about, but it's a blunk call. And if you take the end of your bugle tube and you just kind of like hit it on your hand and you cup it, that's, that's something that bulls do when they're really like excited and like in the middle of like, they're just like really, really hyped up about stuff. Um, but one other one, and Kara mentioned it perfectly that with that bite call, it helps if you need your hands like if you're got your bow in your hand or something diaphragms are really hard for me to use and take a lot of a lot of practice that's also part of preparing for your hunt is learning how to use a diaphragm I have never been able to use one but since this is lady social hour I'm going to say there's a hidden talent that all of you have that you don't know that you have because we're women our voices are a little higher and we could actually use our voice a lot easier to call an elk um, than the guys can. Sorry, guys. I hate to break it. <laughs> um, I, I, I've never been able to use a diaphragm and I only use my voice to call and it has worked. Um, so as you guys are starting to listen to different sounds and you, you can put in your earbuds at work or I always do it actually in the car on the way home, like I'll listen to stuff and try to mimic it. 
with my voice or with a call. Like if you have a call or something to do, the best thing is just to listen to a bunch of different kinds of calls and try to mimic that um, and to be able to use the call and create the sounds with the call because each one is a little different. So there's one. Yeah, add that. I really, really like this quote that uh, Gary Lewis had in Game of Fish magazine that was recent is a lot of people just start calling and then all of a sudden there's an outcome coming and they're not even set up. So mm -hmm. as you get closer to whatever animal it is you're hunting, uh, get set up and maybe go silent for a minute, get yourself set and then start calling. But if you're in a really bad position and you're down or you're up, let's see, the elk is downwind from you, your calling isn't gonna do any good because your scent's going right to them. So think about your positioning and, and your calling, how they go hand in hand. So um, I'm gonna show a quick video. Um, can everybody see the video, the wide open spaces? No. Okay. I think you're gonna have to stop sharing. Yeah, okay. I think so. Go back to here. Okay, now you should, yes? Okay, perfect. So uh, Chris, Christy Titus is very um, amazing with an elk call. Um, so this is a quick a video of her giving you some advanced or different types of call sounds. As an elk hunter, cow sounds are one of the most important sounds that you can make when you're trying to call in a running bull. And today I'm here with my good friend Rocky Jacobson, founder of Rocky Mountain Honey Calls. Rocky is going to walk everybody through on how to make an actual cow sound. And we're going to go into some elk, cow elk language as well. You know, when you're doing a cow sound, uh, there's a different way to make those high notes come to you. Sounds up like this. High note. Mm -hmm. You don't start with a low note and then go to a high note. You don't go. Uh, start with the high note first. If this is a little advanced for you, I want you guys to back up one video and watch the video on how to make an elk sound or a sound out of a diaphragm at all. And then you'll be right caught up with where Rocky's at with this. Okay. When you go after the cow sound, a little bit more volume. Uh, you push a little more air and you draw the nasal sound a little longer. Right. You go into a calf sound, it's a lot shorter, mm -hmm. it's not as loud, and it's kind of subtle, really soft. So it takes less air, less air pressure, less tongue pressure, both of that combined together. So we have a, a very broad language that cow elk and calf elk make. And luckily for us, we're really fortunate that we have a very diverse toolbox of elk calls that we can utilize to make a variety of sounds. So these are the wild theory diaphragm calls. Rocky's also got the mellow yellow mama here, which is designed with the latex having a little, a uh, couple little cuts in the latex that afford you the opportunity of getting those really nice light, nasally cow sounds that the bulls absolutely love. So Rocky, go ahead and demonstrate that one as well. You know, it's very important to have emotion when you call it. If you're just stuck with one sound, that doesn't really broadcast emotion to that bull. You want him to be interested in what's going on where you're at. Not only that, but the more sounds you can make and the more diverse your calling is, the more you're likely to convince that bull that there's a lot of ladies in an area and he definitely wants to check it out. Right. You know, and then you get into your estrus cycle the mm -hmm. cows come into during the, the rough time, which is mainly September. But, and when they first come into heat, they're not really full blown estrus yet, but they're feeling their oats. Mm -hmm. And they'll do a little bit of a, a cry. in the early stages of their of the cycle. But as that bull hasn't found them, they get a little more urgent because now they're into it eight hours, they're gonna start whining a little bit. Mm -hmm. So these more urgent sounds can be made with a diaphragm or you can also use an external read call like this one. This is the Ignite Her Wild Cow Call and uh, 
that also replicate these more urgent sounds. Good. What I like to do is just wash out. I was sound. just getting ready to say that. <laughs> what happens a lot of times when you do that lost calf sound, the cow comes, run maternal instinct, mm -hmm. and there's usually a bull by her, and she also will bring that bull. Potentially, by. it can work. You never know. So if you do a lost calf sound, it's going to be an urgent, repetitious, light baby sound. So imagine if you're on a mountain and you calf elk is lost, it is frantically running around looking for its mom. It's making that sound over and over and over again. And cow elk, their maternal instinct kicks in and they have got to get to that baby and it works very, very effectively. Thank you guys for tuning in with me and my friend Rocky here on uh, elk, cow elk sounds, uh, our advanced strategy. We're gonna now go into some uh, bugle elk sounds and yeah. show you what the elk, bull elk sounds. Right. Stay tuned for our next video. And I don't know if the audio worked great on everybody's end. It was a little quiet on my end, unfortunately. But there are, you could, I dropped the link for that video in the chat. So you guys can maybe pull that up and take a look at it when we get done as well. Um, but there are thousands of videos on YouTube, online that you can search and just listen to all the different sounds. And it, I highly recommend going back and listening to that one because there's a lot of different types of sounds, even though they're all cow elk or, or um, calves, it's different tones that send different messages. It's the way elk are talking to each other. So it's good to look and see and hear uh, the different ways that they're talking. So hopefully you guys can take a look at that video. Yeah, sorry about that audio. I had it turned all the way up on my, my end. So you never know how that's Those gonna turn out. Those high-pitched ones just get a little weird sometimes. So. Yeah. <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> um, We'll we'll kind of run through this fairly quickly, but we don't. If you guys do have questions, um, please feel free to ask. But we'll talk about shot placement. So obviously, um, it is our job as ethical hunters to make sure that we have the best possible shot for that most humane uh, harvest of that animal. The size of the vitals on an elk is about the size of a paper plate. It's huge, and so don't get so caught up that you need to have a group of arrows or your bullets touching within a nick, you know, a quarter. Don't overanalyze that, okay? It's good to have good groupings, but think of the overall picture of an elk vital. It's huge. And so if you're off a half an inch, it's it's okay. Because um, I know a lot of people then start getting um, target anxiety because you're, you're overthinking your process. So um, just think about how big that vitals are on an elk and you'll be just fine. Um, obviously the vitals are the heart, lungs, and liver. Here's another picture of an elk um, enjoying a good wallow. Um, so that's another picture of what you could possibly look for, but see how large that heart, lung, liver area is right behind that front leg. So that's what you're gonna be aiming for. The best shot angles are gonna be your broadside, which is down on the lower one, uh, elk bull picture in the velvet. And the one in the up to upper top um, in the aspens is a slight quartering away. So those are the best shot angles for definitely your archery hunters. Um, front on, I don't recommend um, really for uh, archery hunters just because one, that animal is gonna see that arrow coming right at them. Um, unless you're super close, you're really seasoned, lots of other factors not recommended for an archery shot, but rifle and muzzleloader hunters, if you're on your target, highly effective. Um, and here's just a little shot of what that would look like um, if you have the capabilities of shooting a front on shot um, for that. Field dressing, obviously this is the icing on the cake it is if you get an animal on the ground. Um, even though that is the ultimate goal, um, the experience and what you learn. Um, from just being a field is is the most important thing. Um, that's why we call it hunting and, and not just killing or harvesting. Um, that is the epitome of what we're trying to do is, is put meat on our uh, table and feed our friends and family, but doesn't always happen. 
Um, but once you do get an animal on the ground, especially an elk, it can be a little overwhelming and daunting going, where do I even start? Um, we do have a field dressing video on one of our past lady social hours where I'm uh, actually field dressing an antelope. It's the same kind of process, except for elk's just a bigger animal. Um, the gutless method though does allow you to quarter that animal out. There are so many YouTube resources on how to watch um, doing the gutless method, um, especially on an animal with the size of an elk, you're more than likely not going to be able to pull your truck up to it and load it in the bed of your truck. You're going to actually have to break it down um, and carry it to your vehicle. So game bags, water for cleanup, um, very, very sharp knives. A, a saw is super helpful. Um, you know, the gloves. I mean, Everybody has an overabundance of gloves, I think, still right now. So use those to your advantage. Um, you can even get the AI gloves, which go all the way up to your shoulders. You can find them in feed stores or vet offices. Um, that helps keep you clean. Um, and a tarp or somewhere, something that you can lay those quarters on, your back straps, tenderloins, et cetera. Um, that way it's not just laying on the ground. But the key is to get that meat as cool as humanly possible as fast as possible. You wanna get that hide off. Um, and once you get one side down, then you'll have the hide and then you'll roll it over. Um, and, and this is a two person deal. I mean, you can do it by yourself, but it's, it's, a, it's a project and you're gonna be tired and the water you're gonna need it for yourself um, as well. Um, then if you're gonna save that cape for either a shoulder mount or maybe you shot a cow and the hide's really pretty and you wanna tan it, um, try to keep it as clean as possible. Uh, don't roll it up in a ball when it's still hot and keep it all rolled up because then that heat is gonna cause all that hair to slough off. Um, so once you're able to get it back to wherever you can lay it out again to continue to allow that, that hide to cool, then do that. Um, and then try to take your time to minimize any cuts because any holes that you put in that hide, then the taxidermist has to try to take extra time to sew those holes up and then it's gonna cost you more. So do, do be taking your time uh, on, on field dressing if you're gonna save that cape. Um, Colleen or Tristan, any extra tips or Stephanie on, on this field dressing? I prefer the gutless method to be honest. Um, it is a little cleaner. It's definitely handy when you have a couple people there um, to help, you know, hold up a leg and stuff too. But this is definitely a method too that you can do by yourself and keeps you a little bit cleaner. But um, I, I love the idea. Um, somebody posted, and I think it was Nessa, about using old sheets. Um, old pillowcases were really, really good as game bags also. She also said tent stakes and twine to help, posi to help position and hold animal with no vegetation to help. Um, oh, yeah, very laying, down, laying down a tarp or something too that you could put your quarters on. Um, and I'm actually gonna try something new this year. I have like kind of some of the thin, cheap, cheaper um, game bags that, you know, always come nice and rolled up. I throw in a package. Um, the ones that I had just from my deer hunt last week, which were successful by the way, um, were in still good shape. I didn't get holes in them. I didn't rip them. And I actually cleaned them and bleached them. Um, no, no smell or anything to them. We're going to reuse them. So I'm kind of excited about reusing some game bags too. Um, yeah. So it is possible. <laughs> yeah, they can get expensive. Um, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide and water yeah. works amazingly well on some of those game bags that you buy that are expensive that you want to reuse. Um, or if you use pillow sheets or whatever, that peroxide will take that blood out amazingly. Um, but if you're antelope hunting or you have a smaller deer and you have the ability to load it up on something, then that's also a very effective way. But on an animal such as an elk and you don't have a vehicle or a winch or- Elk, that, elk is a uh, lot. So, you know- <laughs> Even a even cow, it's, it's yeah. an undertaking. Even if it's just a couple people, like obviously you're gonna wanna get that meat cooled down and the cape cooled down as quick as possible. but also be mindful of yourself and of your hunting partner too. Like take breaks, drink water. You know, if you're just breaking it all down is a ton of work, let alone packing it out to wherever you got to get to. So just make sure you guys are staying hydrated, um, 
eat some snacks and stuff before you go on the pack out. Take care of yourself and each other because that meat won't get itself to the cooler. So yeah, absolutely. Um, um, and gutless method, this this quartering out works for bulls and cows. Um, it's very effective if you have to do it by yourself. Um, uh, and it's not so. only if you're by yourself. Like yeah. we do this all the time. Uh, this is like kind of our preferred method to do it because then you don't have to pull a bunch of guts out. And and the reason we do it is because 99% of the time we have to pack out our elk or our whatever that we're after. We are not close to a road that we can get a vehicle to and get loaded up whole, take it back to camp and hang it up. Um, so this helps you if you're in some more of those remote areas. Um, you would definitely have a, you know enough time to break it down. I mean, if if you're in a spot in a position and have somebody to help, especially with elk, get it into the shade and that that kind of thing too will help. Um, you won't have as much with with spoilage then. But this is a method that you can do by yourself, but it is not a required thing, I guess, to do by yourself to answer the question in chat. Yeah, somebody was just asking if, if it was viable to do that on a cow up by yourself, and absolutely it is. Yep. It, it is, um, especially when you get the one half done, it's much easier to roll it over to the other side when half of it is missing. So it is, it is very, very helpful. Um, the other thing, pointer, that I just want to make is, you know, during this point of time, you might be completely exhausted because you were hunting all day, you found your animal, you now had to track it, you finally found it. Um, and now you have to start more work by field dressing it. So just be mindful, don't get in a hurry. You're, you're handling sharp objects, you're, you're, you know, you're with your knives and your saws. And so just be really mindful because the last thing you wanna do is get in a hurry and cut yourself in the middle of nowhere. So definitely just take your time uh, while doing this process and looking out for your, for your partner that's helping you for sure. Um, but this is one of those things, um, we're almost done ladies. So thanks for hanging with us. Um, but definitely take care of yourself and whoever you're hunting with. Um, just be mindful of your, your energy levels. Um, if you're already thirsty, that means you're already dehydrated. So sit down, take in some water, electrolytes. Um, if it's during early season and you're getting hot, take a break. Um, eat a lot of snacks that have high in protein and calories. You're gonna be burning a lot of calories more than you think. So you're gonna to need to replace that so you don't just feel like complete or horrible the next day or later on that day. Um, sugar is good, but don't just take a lot of sugary snacks. I have to have my gummy bears, it's just my thing, but, <laughs> but I'm not gonna just pack gummy bears. <laughs> oh. Um, or Twizzlers, Stephanie, you can't just eat Twizzlers on your elk hunt. Um, so you're gonna have the afternoon sugar crash and then you're not gonna be feeling so good. So um, everything in moderation, but definitely have a lot of protein and calories, lots of water, electrolyte replacements. You don't wanna carry the Gatorade. There's so many different powders available for that mineral and electrolyte replacement. So make sure you're doing that because you don't realize how much you sweat, even in colder season, you're still gonna sweat. So still replace that that you're sweating out. Um, and then staying cool when you're glassing, um, that's the time to take in some water, have your snacks. It's that boring part of the day, have your snacks, drink your water. Um, here's a nice list of snacks to take with you in your pack that you don't really have to worry about spoilage um, that are high in protein light that you can pack out. Um, jet boils are such a lifesaver. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times we have used our jet boil on multiple different hunts. Um, I was on a desert bighorn sheep hunt. It was October. You think it's going to be nice. We were in rain and sleet and cold and wind and wet. And we literally were drinking warm water just to keep us comfortable. So they make them super small and light. You can put them in the bottom of your pack. Always have that available to you. You will not regret a jet boil at all. Um, so invest in one of those. And if it's not like jet boil, the brand, I don't care what it is, <laughs> just go out and get you one because you're not going to regret it whatsoever. Um, and there's nothing like if you're cold and tired and you just have a cup of tea in the woods, it, it does something for your soul <laughs> and for your mantra and your mind and not just the whole thing. It just makes you feel so much better. So just, just do it. Um, it'll make your experience that much more enjoyable for sure. So, um, and then wanted to share, I have not tried this yet, but 
it is on my list of things to try. I might have to try with deer because um, I don't have an elk tag this year either. But um, if I'm successful with my deer hunt, I'm going to try this. It sounds delicious. Um, the picture that I saw looked amazing. <laughs> so um, pot pies are always just amazing comfort food anyway. They're super easy. You just throw a bunch of stuff in and, and put it in the oven. And um, so you can take a screenshot of this. Um, if somebody does do it before I do, let me know how it is. <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Um, but it sounds amazing. Uh, so that way, when you ladies are out there on whatever hunt, just use this recipe and incorporate deer pot pie or javelina or turkey or whatever into that uh, antelope and 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 uh, let us know how it is. I just but. want to add one thing real quick about, you know, taking care of yourself when you're out there. Elk hunting can be pretty hard on your body. Don't be ashamed whatsoever to take a morning off if you need it and rest at camp. Um, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. There's no pressure to get it done faster. You know, it, if you don't take that break when you need it, it's going to, you're not going to have fun. And I just, that was my experience last year. My hips were killing me by day four. And I just, by that morning, waking up at 3 a.m., I, I had to call it a morning because I just needed to stretch my hips and, and chill. Yeah, I have to um, also build on that. That is so key, Stephanie. Um, I had a, a rifle deer hunt one year and for seven days I was chasing a buck of my dreams and it just never could make it happen and on that seventh day I'm like I gotta tap out today I am just done <laughs> we put a lot of miles on it and I thought you know I, I'm not I didn't want to go sit water I'm like ah oh, I just don't I just don't want to do this but I my body was spent and I needed a day of rest and you know what I went and sat water that, that day and I ended up coming home with a deer and I was just so stoked about the deer that I harvested. Um, it was just that's how it was meant to be. And I was so excited. And I know I put in a ton of effort and it's okay. Don't feel guilty for, for taking a day off. And if you change plans, you never know. It could totally work to your advantage. So um, listen to your body. Um, if you're ever hunting with a partner, um, you know, sit down with them and talk to them about, you know, their limitations. Um, don't just go hiking off into 11,000 feet of elevation um, if you know you're that's probably not a good idea. Don't put yourself in a situation that, that could harm you or your, your hunting partner because again, you're not going to want to come back <laughs> and do it. So so definitely listen to yourself and, and listen to your buddy. Say, hey, you know what? I don't think this is a good idea. Or yeah, we're good. Let's Let's try this. But know your limitations for sure. Does anybody else have any questions? You guys have been an amazingly engaging group today. Thank you guys so much. I apologize we ran like a lot over, but we appreciate your attentiveness and, and wanting to stick with us. That's amazing. Yeah, we we can definitely, I know we've gone, you know, a little bit longer today, but that was a lot of really good info to cover. And I really hope that helped you guys out. Um, and if you have questions that you think of after the seminar or, you know, as your hunts get closer, reach out to us, like give us a call, shoot us an email. Um, you can always ask us. We would be happy to brainstorm some ideas and stuff with you and, and help you out and answer questions about specific areas too. Cause I know we got some of those in the chat tonight and I don't want to, you know, us go too far into the weeds and talk about every single unit that everyone has this year. Um, because we've already been kind of going tonight, but please reach out to us. We, we would be happy to help you guys out um, and help you prepare for your elk hunt this year. And I did promise Stephanie Canada that I would address this because it's going to help all of us. So thank you, Stephanie, for submitting your question to me earlier. Um, she had a, an elk hunt in 2B and it sounds like it was really cool and amazing, but um, she had asked if you're hunting in an area where it's super dry and everything's crunchy and, and this goes for snow too. So if you're on old snow, it's like, you're like walking on light bulbs. Um, so how in the world can you hunt in an area that's like super crunchy and, and you can't, you just feel like no matter what you do, you're, you can't be stealthy. Um, your, your foot placement is definitely going to be key, especially if you have no wind. Um, they're going to hear absolutely everything. So 
you're just going to have to slow down what you're doing and watch your foot placement. Um, I've seen out on the market, they have these certain little booties you can wear for your archery hunters. Um, don't recommend in New Mexico just wearing your socks, but you know what? I have done that a few times on my archery hunts by if I take my boots off and I, I might be in my socks for the next 200 yards. Um, but then I'm super mindful of where my foot is going to go. Um, but that is something that if you need to close the distance and you can safely do so, um, double up your socks and head on a little bit out there. Um, but that if you can't do that or you don't want to do that, then just slow your roll and look at where your foot is going before you take that step. Um, or avoid super crunchy, crispy things that you know, which is hard sometimes <laughs> to do, but um, especially after all this moisture and all this stuff is going to be super nice and green now, but come late season, it's going to all be crispy and crunchy. So um, but just take your time. And I thought I have to share this in the chat for those of you guys who have cannot see your chat is because we are, I think, probably 99% uh, female on this call. She just said, think of your feminine products, because sometimes you can get hit with that unexpectedly and in the middle of nowhere. So take some extra stuff in your pack with you just in case or maybe your friend <laughs> just in case. Because that's no fun being on a, a long deer hunt and don't have anything. So good tip, Jess. Appreciate that. It's so good to see some new faces and stuff in here too. And I'm so thankful that Free Lady is joining us tonight. And um, we're going to do this again next month. We're getting yeah. you know kind of topics and stuff lined up. But for this recording, if there's anything that you missed or you want to share it with somebody who wasn't able to join us, um, it will be posted on our YouTube channel by tomorrow um I oh assume. i don't know if it's gonna be that fast okay well give us a day or two yeah <laughs> and it, and realistically it, realistically <laughs> it'll be up on our channel so um you can go back and watch it or just listen to it in the background while you're at work or driving or whatever um share it with anyone you think uh would find some of this information helpful as well because uh, we covered a lot of really good topics tonight and a lot of this even though we focused a lot on elk, could be applied to various species. So hopefully that helps tee you guys up for some amazing hunts coming up for you this fall. And don't forget, we love hearing about your hunts. So don't forget to share some of your stories with us. I think probably our end of the year um, social hour is gonna be sharing stories of how our season's gone and crazy things that you maybe have seen or heard <laughs> on hunts before. Cause I think we wanna have a fun, campfire storytelling one and oh, take those see? pictures is what you're saying yes yeah. take the pictures we hear ourselves talk on this all the time we want to hear from you guys so we're probably going to do a little bit more interactive one by the end of the year but um yes it will be posted on our youtube channel you guys can watch it again great well thank you ladies all so much this evening have a great great evening and good luck to everybody who still has tags to notch so thank you.